Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer. Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer. Oh, 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 Michael Shermer. Oh, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer. Come on. Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer. Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer. Oh, 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 Michael Shermer, 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 Shermer. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Shermer. Always great. Tam Tan, amazing. I've been at all ten. It's uh, it's kind of, it's come a long ways. I have two favors to ask of you. So um, our book table is down there. When you go by there, please say hi to Pat Lindsay. Pat is the person who does all the uh, covers of Skeptic Magazine, all the layout and design and typography, and all the flyers and all the artwork you see on the web page and so on. She's uh, my partner in this, in the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine and she doesn't get a lot of recognition. She's behind the, the scenes, the power behind the scenes there. So say hi to her and also to uh, Will who is our webmaster who does Skeptic.com and when you get a chance, the second favor is uh, check out Skeptic.com and our Skepticism 101 program which we just launched uh, last week. And so we're taking skepticism into the classroom, how to teach a course in skepticism how to take a course in skepticism. It's a little bit like TED.com or uh, the Khan Academy. We're accumulating videos and PowerPoints and keynotes and lectures, lecture notes, readings, um, allusions, projects that uh, teachers can assign to students, things like that. So if, it, and it's all free, you just download stuff. Uh, so if you're an educator of any kind, a teacher or just a person interested in educating people, if you have materials you'd like to uh, you know, put up on the web page for people to use that you think might be useful for teaching, critical thinking, skepticism, all the good stuff that we do, uh, we're, we, we'd love to have your input on that. So uh, I, when I was walking back to the green room here, I noticed the crawl said something about Michael Schirmer making a presentation about his previous book simultaneously about his next book. I'm really embarrassed because that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> So I was sitting back there thinking, can I, is there some other talk I can give? <laughs> and the problem is I'm a, I'm a writer, so I write about everything I speak about, so it, it's kind of inevitable. Um, so the, the next book is, um, oh, I guess, do we have, is it on the screens? No, okay, so if we could put up the, yeah, okay. Um, so um, what I'm doing here is uh, taking an inspiration from, um, a 19th century abolitionist named uh, Theodore Parker. Uh, I'm just trying to get a full screen here uh, so I can see what it actually says. There we go. That should do it. Um, is that, can you see that? You know what, I think it, uh, I got to go to view. Yeah, you guys, you didn't turn it on to the, uh, to the play. Here we go. It's play is what we want. There we go. <clears throat> um, so he writes, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. <clears throat> My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, and from what I see, I'm sure it bends toward justice. So we've come a long ways in a century and a half um, in terms of figuring out uh, what has actually been going on. So what I'm doing is I'm taking, I'm pushing forward from uh, these four books, my own, The Mind of the Market, sort of, I always pick up in the last chapter and, 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 and write a new book from there. But, uh, but Matt Ridley's The Rational Optimist, Robert Wright's Non-Zero, and especially Steve Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, have all tracked uh, the trend lines that things are getting better. Things are getting better economically, politically, uh, socially, culturally, and especially morally. So where I'm going with this brief presentation is I'm going to do a data dump of, of show you that things really are getting better and then offer some explanations for why and ultimately I think it comes down to the fact that uh, it's reason and science. I'm using the word science, the moral arc of science in the broadest sense of, of reason, empiricism, logic, open-mindedness, uh, and liberal values that came out of the Enlightenment. So that's where I'm going with this. So something extraordinary happened from uh, hunter-gatherers to consumer traders, uh, just start, starting economically and then politically. So if you count up all the 
uh, items uh, in a Yanomamo village and you calculate what their average annual income is, the equivalent thereof, they average about $100 per person per year and they have about 300 different items in their uh, catalog of stuff. If you walk into the Manhattan village and count up all the, all the goodies and products that the Manhattanites uh, have in their stores, it comes out to about 10 billion uh, different products. That's based on the barcode, uh, SKU, stock keeping unit system of the barcodes. Uh, and about 400 times uh, more income, about $40,000 per person per year. The question is, how did this happen? Uh, so here's, the, here's a different hockey stick curve. Uh, that is the uh, tracking of world GDP per capita of just a little over 60, it's about $6,600 per person per year for the entire planet. Uh, and all that has happened in the last 150 years or so. And this is the projection, it'll double by 2030. Uh, every single one of, on average, across the world of the 10 billion or so that will be at 2030 will average about uh, $12,000 per person per year. Obviously there's a big dis difference between the West and other countries, but we'll come back to that. So as people got wealthier, a lot of other things got better, poverty, uh, collapsed dramatically, that is poverty defined by a dollar per day um, as the baseline rate, and that's, that's tracked down uh, fairly consistently. Even in Africa, even though it's been bumpy, bouncing up and down uh, for the last half century, the last uh, decade and a half or so, it's getting much better even in Africa. Global cereal, har global cereal harvest, so you see the flat black line there is the acres harvested. So we're not harvesting any more acres, but the yield per acre has been increasing, thanks to science and technology. Life expectancy at birth, world average from just a little below 50 to just a little under 70 now in the last half century. Percentage of increase in world population is going down. World population is not going down yet, but the rate of increase is going down, and eventually that will flatten out. And uh, uh, the UN projects that about by 2100, it'll flatten out at about 10 billion people, and then we'll start decreasing. We'll be back to where we, w we are now by about 2150 or so. Uh, so even though overpopulation has always been a mantra of my generation, I think uh, there's progress there too. So just um, culturally, just think about King Louis XIV, the Sun King, who had a fabulous kitchen and hundreds of servants and compare that to the average middle class person today where uh, you can walk into, you, you and I have hundreds of servants waiting for us right now. You can go down to Starbucks and there's a barista waiting for you to make your venti latte just the way you like it. There's somebody to work on your car and so on. There's kitchens like this fabulous kitchen, way better than anything King Louis XIV had uh, that, you, that you can find in, in almost any middle class home being built today. So, and as life got uh, better, it also got uh, safer. Uh, this is a little known fact that rates of homicide have plummeted in the last uh, six, seven hundred years from about 35 murders per 100,000 uh, to, in Europe, less than one per 100,000 today. It would be zero, except there's always some nut job that does some crazy thing that you can't control for. Otherwise, violence is practically zeroed out in Europe. It's about a little under five per 100,000 in America, but even that's mostly clustered in inner cities and gang-related, drug-related uh, crimes. Uh, you can see it in, uh, if we track the databases of a lot of different data sets here, violent deaths in prehistoric societies uh, compared to uh, state societies today. So the red line there is the average of all those data sets to the left of uh, the percentage of deaths in warfare. And uh, here's the United States and Europe in the 20th century, uh, the world for the entire 20th century. The world in 2005 is not even a single digit, uh, a single uh, blip on the screen there. And, uh, and then you do another data set here of war deaths per 100,000 people per year in non-state societies. So the previous data set were archeological uh, data sets. These are current non-state societies. Uh, and their average rates of death uh, per 100,000 people uh, in war. So that's the average on that red bar there compared to the, uh, Germany in the 20th century, Russia in the 20th century, Japan in the 20th century, the United States in the 20th century, the entire world in the 20th century, and uh, in the world in 2005. Again, not even a single uh, blip on the screen there. So things are definitely getting better 
in terms of warfare. Again, homicide rates have plummeted uh, from uh, almost 100 in some areas to uh, practically down to below zero now. You can see it in, in different uh, independent uh, data sets from different countries in Europe. And, uh, and then the overall, the blue dot, the non-state societies average versus over the past 700 years of the plummeting rate. Uh, so it's a logarithmic scale there. So you, you're going almost 100 per 100,000 murders down to less than one per 100,000 in Western Europe. Uh, even wars are becoming more civilized even in the 20th century. So it's hard to get around, it's hard to say things are getting better and ignore the 20th century. But it's good to remember the 20th century was 100 years long, not 50. The first 50 years looked bad, but the second 50, so as we'll see. Great power wars, here's some more data sets from Levy and Thompson. Great power wars, 1,500 to 2,000, a portion of years that they spent fighting each other has plummeted down, bounced around on the bottom there and is now zero. Duration of wars involving great powers. We're talking about great European powers here uh, between 1,500 and 2,000. Again, bouncing around but uh, plummeting back down to zero now. Frequencies of wars involving a great power. Just think about it now. What are the chances that, that France will march an army through the channel and invade London? <laughs> it's not going to happen, right? And yet, uh, and yet that was the history of the great powers, uh, is that they always were at war with one another. Uh, so again, remember, the 20th century is 100 years long, so although there's the two huge blips of the First and Second World Wars, the big mystery to explain is how come there haven't been any others since then. In fact, since 1946, there's been zero wars between the U.S. and USSR, zero nuclear weapons used, zero wars between the great powers, zero wars between Western European countries. Before 1945, there were two wars every year for 600 years, and that has ended. Even genocide. Uh, so these are Rudy, Rudy Rommel's data sets um, that have been then since collaborated by others. That uh, so that even though there's Rwanda and Cambodia and things are grim. So, so here's the problem: our brains are designed to design evolved. Sorry, sorry to get past that word. <laughs> designed by natural selection. Okay, thank you. <laughs> to just notice the bad news in the immediate horizon of our time frame and, and environment. So of course we, we, we notice Rwanda and Cambodia and so we remember these things more freshly, but uh, they are minor blips compared to uh, hom uh, genocides in, 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 in previous centuries, especially culminating in the Holocaust. So how did all this progress happen when we live in such a tribal world? Okay, I'm just gonna blast through. By the way, that was like 1% of the data slides uh, that I could have presented. There's a lot of data to show things really are getting better. Okay, what happened? Uh, so five points there that we'll go through, beginning with the, uh, the fact that we do have moral emotions. We are moral creatures by nature. We evolved a dual moral nature. We have a good side, that is, within our groups, uh, we practice amity, we're nice, we're cooperative, we're pro-social, we're altruistic uh, to our fellow tribe members, and between groups, we practice enmity. So we have a little bit of Oscar Schindler, a little bit of Amon Gert. Uh, we have inside of us both Colonel Kurtz and Captain Willard, and we are both uh, good Kirk and bad Kirk. <laughs> hey, you watch that episode again, that's pretty deep. You know, when Spock explains to McCoy why this is such a good experiment to understand the dual nature. And in fact, Roddenberry had, uh, had really constructed the whole cast to be like that. So uh, uh, McCoy is sort of the emotional brain, and Spock is like the rational brain, and, and then Kirk is the, the ideal I, of both. You've got to have testosterone and oxytocin. <laughs> Kirk had maybe a little too much testosterone, but that's okay. <laughs> he always got the girl. Anyway, so there's a little bit of that. In other words, we, we're both naughty and nice. More seriously, I think both the, um, the Stanley Milgram shock experiments and Phil Zimbardo's uh, faux uh, um, prison experiments show that on the one hand, it is easy to get people, even uh, middle class college students, to commit acts of violence. It's not hard to do. But on the other hand, if you actually watch the videotapes and in the replication since then, uh, people are very distressed at doing it. It's hard to get them to do it. They can, you can get them to do it but they're not happy about doing it. There's a whole program you have to set up to, to shift the, the, the good part of our nature and squelch that down and, and bring up the other part of the nature. It, it's doable, 
so the whole point of civil society is to set it up in a way to attenuate the one and, and accentuate the other. Uh, and the long-term trend is that there's been an expanding evolutionary circle of sentiments. That is, evolution granted us a sense of empathy for our own kin and kind, and the circle has expanded from bands and tribes to chieftains and states to all races and sexes. Well, not quite, but we're pretty close. We're getting there. By the way, I'll make my annual prediction about gay marriage. In a couple of decades, this will be like the black and white drinking fountain thing. It'll be much ado about nothing, and people in 50 years from now will look back and they'll write the little history about the early 21st century and say, what were they thinking? That was insane. <laughs> oh, and, and, and by the way, uh, the Christians will take credit for it. <laughs> They'll say, you know that Episcopalian minister? That was our guy. He was one of ours, yes. Right? Anyway, I'm just putting that on the record, so that's there. Um, so my argument is that we've been climbing this, this pyramid of, of on the bottom rungs, being most concerned about ourselves, our immediate family, our kin and kind, our fellow tribe members, and ignoring every, every, all the rungs above it. But historically speaking, we've been shifting our empathetic concerns to the higher rungs, the community, people in other tribes, even other species, and maybe even the biosphere. It's a long road to hoe, but we're getting there. Okay, how did this happen? Two, the Leviathan state. You have to have a, you have to have a state. Uh, okay, so here's the non-libertarian Shermer speaking. <laughs> uh, you gotta have a system of rules or people will cheat, in case you didn't notice. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not just talking about sports. Uh, so what basically what a Leviathan state does, this is Thomas Hobbes Leviathan, this was his argument, that you have to have a state that takes a monopoly on violence, so all the little uh, uh, mafioso types and thugs and gangs, uh, that's what drives rates of violence up, is they solve their own social problems and conflicts personally. Uh, it's called self-help justice. If the state doesn't do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going over to your house at midnight, and we're going to settle the score tomorrow at noon uh, you know, with the, out on the street, something like that. The state says, you're not going to do that anymore. We're going to do that. That's why the law says it's the state versus so-and-so. The state is now taking care of justice. So that reduces the need for deterrence and vengeance, and that reduces violence, and it makes uh, conflicts resolved in a more peaceful way. <laughs> The problem is the Leviathan state can turn into an autocracy, a theocracy or secular dictatorship, which is a destroyer of peace, prosperity, and freedom. So not any state will do. Democracies are better. The first theoretician on this was none other than Immanuel Kant in a little-known book that he wrote called Perpetual Peace. He basically outlined three conditions you need uh, for this to operate. He called it a republic, but he, he meant a, de a democracy of some sort. And then the second one was... Um, some sort of uh, United Nations or a League of Nations or some kind of interdependency between nations. And then the third one was uh, sort of the interdependency of people through trade, through commerce. Uh, in the 20th century, Rudy, Rudy Rommel was the first to identify the fact that governments uh, kill a lot of people. So although violence has declined between people, governments got more violent for a while until democratic peace process took over in the, in the last century or so. His books, Death by Government and Power Kills, uh, documents some of that. Now, Rudy was um, the first to put forward this idea that Tom Friedman picked up in, in The World is Flat, that no two countries with McDonald's ever fight each other. <laughs> well, that's actually not quite true, but, but it was Rudy that first identified that through a, a smaller data set uh, over the course of the last two centuries, in which he claimed that there were no wars between democratic nations, and of course, uh, poli sci uh, professor jumped all over that and said, oh, there's lots of different examples of democracies that have fought each other. The Greek Wars, the Punic Wars, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the War of 1812, the American Civil War. These are all democracies fighting each other. Uh, so we have to move away from uh, the black and white two categories. You're either democracy or you're not, because there's lots of shades of gray in between. The best book on this is Triangulating Peace. Bruce Russett and John O'Neill, they, they tested Kant's thesis of the triangle of peace. Uh, and this is the correlates of war projects. So they have 2,300 militarized interstate disputes in their database. So it's 10 times the size, of, the size of Rudy Rummel's database. And then they use the Polity Project, which assigns uh, each country a democracy score. So you're a democracy from 1 to 10. It's not just you either are or you aren't. It's a scale. This is good science, right? Shades of gray. Okay. And, and that was, those are defined on how competitive the political process is, how openly the leaders are chosen, how many constraints on the leader's power. 
So they found that when both countries are fully democratic, disputes dec decrease by 50%. When the less democratic member of a pair was a full autocracy, it doubled the chance of a quarrel. So shifting from a minor democracy to an autocracy increases the probability of violence between states. And so there you can see the rise of democracies and the collapse of autocracies in the last half century. We have to just think about that. There, there were no liberal democracies anywhere in the world in 1900, zero. Even in America, women couldn't vote. Half the pop adult population could not vote in America until 1920. I mean, that's really amazing. Uh, on the one hand, it's a little embarrassing, but on the other hand, we've come a long ways. <clears throat> uh, so here's the, here's the part three, the part that the libertarians will like, <laughs> uh, and that's uh, trade or general commerce. Uh, that is, plunder is non-zero. This was uh, Bob Wright's argument in non-zero, that there's been an increase in non-zero games. An exchange is a way when it's done by the rules. <laughs> uh, trade is a non-zero sum, win-win type exchange. And, it, and improving technology allows trades of, of good and ideas. Matt Ridley calls this ideas of having sex. It's, it's all, even just trading products for money, and just, just basic uh, shopping. This is a form of swapping ideas and swapping it. Just anytime people exchange, anytime strangers exchange with one another in a positive some way, it reduces the, uh, uh, the, the probability you'll treat them as a, a, a tribe member in some other tribe who, who's an other, who's not like us. It reduces that, those sort of tribal barriers there. So open economic barriers decreases political barriers and therefore leads to more empathetic consideration of the other as a fellow tribe member. So Russett and O'Neill put that to the test in their data set. And they found that for every pair of at-risk nations, they entered the amount of trade as a proportion of their GDP, gross domestic product, for the more trade-dependent member. They found that countries that depended more on trade in a given year were less likely to have a militarized dispute in the subsequent year, controlling for democracy, power ratio, great power status, and economic growth. Democratic peace works only when both members of a pair are democratic, but trade works with either member of the pair uh, has a market economy. I think it was Friedman that said, I, one reason not to go to war with China is they make my car, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or my computer, or my iPad, or whatever. So uh, the rates of uh, international trade have gone up dramatically in the last um, a little over a century, especially in the last half century. So international trade is good. Uh, so you put them all together uh, into the peace triangle, democracy, trade, and then the third one, membership in IGOs, intergovernmental organizations. So uh, Russett and O'Neill counted the number of IGOs that every pair of nations jointly belonged to and ran a regression analysis with democracy and trade scores and found that democracy favors peace, trade favors peace, membership in IGOs favors peace. And a pair of countries that are in the top tenth of the scale in all three variables are 83% less likely than an average pair of nations to have a militarized dispute in a given year. So that's the growth of membership in intergovernmental organizations. Why does that work? Because evil happens in secrecy. This is why North Korea is a, a secret society. The, the moment everybody is watching you and people know what you're doing and people are talking about you, you're less likely to commit violence. This is the whole reason for joining these organizations. Even though countries don't really want to selfishly, uh, it's a good thing that we've shifted toward that. So that's the third in those. Point four, um, the classical liberalism and the civilizing process. By classical liberalism, I just mean the Enlightenment values that we're all familiar with. Uh, since the time of the Enlightenment, we've expanded the idea of uh, liberal values of treating people as an end in themselves rather than a means to an end. That's the basis of Kantian ethics. Uh, and the first guy to create a data set on this is uh, well, what Steve Pinker calls the most important person you've never heard of, Norbert Elias, the civilizing process. Uh, Elias was a sociologist, so his data set were old manuscripts with um, uh, woodcuts about what life was like in the Middle Ages and books of manners about what you should not be doing. Don't foul the staircases, corridors, closets, or wall hangings with urine and other filth. Don't relieve yourself in front of ladies. Don't touch your private parts under your clothes. Don't greet someone while they are urinating. <laughs> don't make noise when you pass gas. When you share a bed with someone in an inn, don't lie so close to him that you touch him. Don't blow your nose into the tablecloth. Don't spit into the bowl while washing. Don't pick your nose. Anyway, you get the idea. People in the Middle Ages were disgusting. So Elias's data set was showing that, in fact, there's been a sort of a trickle down from the aristocrats to the 
middle classes and the lower classes, that we should stop acting like animals and start acting like civilized people. When you do that, you're less likely to you know, stab the guy with your knife across the table or something like that. In other words, violence starts to decrease, his argument was, with that uh, increase in civilizing process. And all this leads to the humanitarian revolution and the rights revolutions. So we can see, just I'll just do another data dump for you here. These are uh, lynchings from 1860 to 19, 1880, 1960. Uh, hate crimes, uh, murders of uh, blacks, 1996. Unfortunately, the FBI only started keeping track of these data sets uh, in 1996, so we don't have a long data set. But the trend lines are still good. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks, intimidation, simple assault, aggravated assault, all decreasing. Whites hostility to blacks. These are uh, uh, questionnaires, you know, if a black moved in in the neighborhood, would you move, so forth. Those have all been shifting toward uh, more tolerant responses in the last half century. Uh, discrimination against minorities, uh, so countries with policies favoring ethnic minorities has been going up, and countries that discriminate against ethnic minorities has been going down. Uh, rates of rape, again, these are just FBI statistics uh, that have gotten really good in the last couple decades, but uh, tracks since 1975 have been going down. Uh, domestic violence has been decreasing. Uh, spousal murder uh, both in both directions has been decreasing. Uh, U.S. states with corporal punishment has been decreasing. There's still some. Approval of spanking, even that has been decreasing, mostly in the Western world, slower in the United States, but getting there. Child abuse has been decreasing. School violence has been decreasing. States that have decriminalized homosexuality from 1791 to 2009, uh, world versus the United States. And so we've lagged a little behind, but, but we're catching up. Uh, Anti-gay attitudes, again, these, uh, the General Social Science Survey and Gallup, these data sets show that people are becoming more tolerant. Uh, and that, again, hate crime, intimidation has been decreasing. This is the data set from the FBI since 1996. Even animals, uh, the interest in hunting has been decreasing. It's still popular in the Midwest, I know, but. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and vegetarianism has been increasing. The number of animals harmed in movies has been decreasing. Uh, in fact, it's zero now, except for that horse movie, I guess, last year or something like that. But even that, the fact that, we, that, that the fact that a horse was killed in a movie makes front page story, that's progress. That's moral progress, right? Uh, and then finally, I'll just end with, uh, with a three cheers for freedom and uh, for science. That is that, that by science, again, empiricism, logic, reason, open-mindedness, open inquiry, uh, because scientific thinking is more abstract and abstract reasoning expands the evolutionary circle of sentiments. So here I'll put forward an idea of a moral Flynn effect. The Flynn effect is that IQ scores have been going up three points every 10 years for the last half century. Uh, James Flynn is a um, New Zealand uh, psychologist who first discovered this. And, uh, and it's not on the learning parts of the IQ test like uh, information, arithmetic, and vocabulary. It's in the abstract reasoning, those tasks where you have to rotate a figure in space like three different times and then pick the one down below that matches what it would look like. We're getting better at that. And that's a form of moral, because morality requires abstract reasoning. You have to rotate yourself in space and become somebody else and imagine what it would feel like if that happened to you and then you can decide what the moral thing to do is. We appear to be getting better at that. And so literacy, what can we do about it? Literacy, education, public discourse, more abstract reasoning, rising above parochial vantage point, and we're replacing the morality of tribalism, authority, and puritanism with the morality of fairness and universal rules. We've expanded the circle of sentiments, which we're continuing to do. And I'll end with uh, the man who picked up from that Theodore Parker quote, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., not in his I Have a Dream speech, but in his uh, uh, slightly less famous um, How Long do we have to go speech? And he said, let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Now he was a preacher, so he's crediting probably sources you and I wouldn't. I think I can actually show, I actually have a whole set of slides. On it. it isn't religion. Religion is always lagged behind. They're always just like a decade behind the social wave of moral change. It's the enlightenment values of liberal uh, thinking, of democracy, of uh, expanding the circle of sentiments, other consideration, people are value, valuable in and of themselves, and it's the whole idea of science as an open-ended, open-minded, liberal tradition of testing ideas and finding out what works. That's the best thing that's happened to us in the last, last half century. It is science that did it. Thank you.